looking at two passages, uh, beginning first at 1 Corinthians 5, which we have gone through, but will be helpful uh, background and helpful to inform us as we go forward with Matthew 18. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 1 through 8. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles that a man has his father's wife and you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I indeed as absent in the body but present in spirit have already judged as though I were present, him who has so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And our reading from Matthew, chapter 18, we'll be looking looking or reading verses 15 through 20, but mostly looking at verse 15 tonight. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if you will not hear, take take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be like, be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they will ask, it will be done for them by my father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Let us pray. Lord, as we come to this text and we come before you, we rejoice that you have given us the word and the spirit that you would enable us to understand these truths. Let us think of no other but you and plead no other righteousness but the righteousness of Christ. Trust no other atonement. Look to no other word than what you have given to us in Christ. For it is in Christ that we desire to be found. It is through Christ that we look to being conformed. It is by your spirit that we look to be uplifted and changed. Use your word and your spirit in us so that we may walk as Christ has called us to, as he commands us to, even in our text before us. Father, fill me with the Spirit to preach your word faithfully. Let us hear from Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Now, just a pastor's note. Before I start, given our current situation in the church, both Seth and I thought that it would be wise to preach upon church discipline. Uh, This is not a place that either one of us wanted to go. And we just felt that it was necessary for the benefit of the body of Christ. And I want you to know Also, given the sensitivity of the subject, especially now, I want you to know that the bulk of my sermon was written in 2005. That I preached this sermon in 2005. And the reason I did that, that I relied so heavily on 
the manuscript that I wrote then is so that the current situation would not influence me in a way that I don't want to go. I also want you to know that part, part, portions of the sermon are also from o, o, OPC Pastor Paul Vigiano and his sermon series on the same topic dated back in 2007. But there's a lot here, and I pray that we learn from it. Now, several weeks, weeks ago, I mentioned that one of the issues of the Reformation, what the Reformation was dealing with, was that they were trying to determine a true church from a false church. And we do the same, hopefully today. They were do, doing this, and here's the problem, they were doing this because they could clearly see that some Catholic churches seemed more like true churches and some Protestant churches seemed more like false churches. And so they started to ask the question, how do we know the true church from the false? It's a question we need to ask because Jesus warns us about false prophets that come into the church. Doesn't matter whether they're Protestant or Catholic. There are false teachers. He said, beware of false prophets who come to you, (coughs) who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Our problem is, as we hear the words ravenous wolves, and in our minds, we think of, hopefully, ravenous wolves. Wolves that teeth are bearing, that are coming out at us to destroy us. That's kind of the imagery that Jesus is painting here. Yet the reality is, is they don't look like that at all. So he says, you will know them by their fruit. And ravenous wolves are very good at making themselves look like other sheep. It's the wolf's fruit that shows us who they really are. And what is their, what is their fruit in the pulpit? How do they handle the sacraments? What do they do with errant, errant congregation members? What do they do? How do they function? That's a part of the fruit that you're looking for in someone who's leading a church. Fortunately for us, the reformers came upon an answer. And the Belgic Confession, question number 29, deals with this very issue. It says, we believe that we ought to discern diligently and very carefully by the word of God, what is the true church for all sects in the world today claim for themselves the name of church. Lots of people claim the name of church. How do we know whether it's a true church or not? That's what they're answering. We are not speaking here of the company of hypocrites who are mixed among the good in the church with the not, with, and who, nonetheless, are not part of it, even though they are physically there. But we are speaking of the distinguishing the body and fellowship of the true church from all sects that call themselves the church. The first, they said, the true, uh, they give us three principles. The true church can be recognized if it has the following marks. The church engages in the preaching of the gospel. It makes the use of the pure administration of the sacraments as Christ instituted, instituted them. And it practices church discipline for the correcting of faults. In short, it governs itself. And this is key. You you have to understand that. It governs itself according to the pure word of God, rejecting all things contrary to it and holding Jesus Christ as the only head. By these marks, one can be assured of recognizing the true church and no one ought to be separated from it. So they're showing us and they're recognizing that the true church is to govern itself through these marks. The reformers understood these three things. They preached the gospel of Christ and they did the the exercising and uh, administration of the sacraments. It's the third sign. It's that third sign that is so uh, 
absent in our current Christian culture. I was reading, well, I saw on YouTube while I was at school this week, a fellow teacher who had been a teacher for 25 years and she came out and said she had to quit because the discipline problems were so great in the school and that they had gotten so far away from any level of discipline that there was no control over them. Without discipline, without discipline, we can't expect anything else other than chaos. A true church must learn from Christ. It must exercise discipline. And again, think about it. The word discipline comes from the word that we get for disciple. Same basic root word. If you're going to be a disciple of Christ and walk with him, you are going to be under discipline all the time already. I'd like to point out that in our worship, we are under discipline from the moment of the call to the worship to the moment that we exit after the benediction. We are being disciplined. It's not in a formal sense, but were we not called to repentance? Did we not just confess our sins? Did we not just repent of our sins? And fall on our knees before the Lord and humble ourselves. That is being, that is under discipline. We are being discipled in the ways of Christ. Our liturgy is very conducive to disciplining the believer. We are called to God, by God, to worship. We are called to come and confess. We are called to be washed. We're called to come to his table. He feeds us and blesses us and sends us out. This is basic discipline at its, well, this is discipline at its basic root, its basic core. That's what it is. Now, we know that we preach the gospel so that men will be saved, but we also preach the gospel so that discipline is taking place as the word of God is is being put forth. But what is the actual purpose of church discipline on a more formal level? Well, it's got three purposes. First, the purpose of the church of church discipline is to keep the church body pure. The goal is to purify the body and purge that which is not to be proven of the church. I know of one CREC church that is very quick to exercise excommunication when necessary. And we know of a a young lady that was in that church who renounced her faith. And the very next Sunday, they'd contacted her and says, is this true? Is there anything we can talk out of? And no, I don't want anything to do with the church. They excommunicated her because they wanted her to feel the weight of what she was doing. It's, It's not Becca. Okay, we're not talking about that. But that's part of it. They're trying to keep the body pure. If there's somebody in the body who has renounced the faith, but they're still coming along, they need to be excommunicated, cut off. The second purpose of church discipline is to actually restore the sinning member. And we'll see that when we look at verse 15. Part of the goal is to help the one who has fallen away see the need to repent and be restored to the body of Christ. But allow me to say, without repentance, there can be no restoration. Without repentance, you cannot go any further. You cannot do anything like that. Third, and this is sort of my own discovery, the purpose of church discipline is for our own sanctification. When you begin to deal with a sinning brother, it really does have a purifying effect in your own life. And it makes you examine yourself to see where you are in relationship to all of this. It's the get the log out of your own eye before you get the speck out of your brothers. And it causes you to realize Am I, do I have the right attitude in this? Because the correct attitude in going through this pro- process is to win the person back to the Lord. As Paul Vigiano pointed out so aptly, it's not to win the argument. It's to win the person back to the Lord. 
The Lord also uses the process in our lives in order to sanctify us, to make us cling to him all the more. And so this section that we're looking at tonight is basically all under the one word. It's all under the idea of confrontation. Church discipline begins with confrontation. Confrontation is necessary both for the peace and purity of the church as well as the one who is in sin. Now John Calvin writes that when when confronting a sinful brother, the sinful brother will respond either one of two ways. He'll either go into denial or he'll go into evasion. He'll try to evade the topic. He'll try to move on. It was Calvin's opinion that if the person was evading, you would bring in two more witnesses. You might have a shot at bringing them back. But the one who was in utter denial was the one who was the hardest to reach. He will continue to deny even when witnesses are brought forth into the situation. So we are looking at confrontation. Next week we'll look at basically the idea of church discipline and the following week after that we'll look at the authority of the church. For as we see the first section, verse 15, is that of confrontation. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. Okay? What Jesus is saying is he's trying to help us see our personal responsibility in dealing with someone who has sinned and help us see that it is, with Christ, it is what Christ is commanding us to do. When we see somebody in sin and they continue on in that sin, we are to confront them. He's coming at it, and the only way I think that we can grab onto that reality is coming at it from a covenantal model. Understanding that we've been in covenant together. That we have taken vows together. That we have walked together. That we are united in Christ together. So to continually sin, it doesn't matter what the sin is, to continually sin and not be repentant of that sin needs to be dealt with. The second section that we're going to look at next week is that of church discipline. It's verses 16 and 17. But if he will not hear, take, it, take with you one or two more. That by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. Notice that our first section is just dealing with the sinning brother. The second portion is opening it up to the leadership of the church. The third section goes on even further and shows that the leadership of the church does indeed have authority. Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. This is the most challenged area that Christ gives us. To deal with church discipline and unrepentant men and women when we live in such an anti-authoritarian atmosphere. We have to know that the church does indeed have true authority. The moment we say this out in the world, men immediately line up their excuses for their rebellion and say, how dare you? You have no right to question me. Now to our text. Moreover, if your brother sins, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. Now here we got another section that has a textual problem. Look at your, got your scripture open, looking at it, looking at it. Most of your copies probably say, moreover, if your brother sins against you. Okay? The against you isn't there. It's not added until the later manuscripts. The support is that it should not be there at all. So what we should be hearing first is if your brother sins. 
And if you are aware of this sin, or if you are a witness of this sin, you need to confront the brother. I had a friend back in seminary, a guy by the name of Jim Wojcik, who was just so gifted at this. You could be talking to him about something and he would just like zero right in real gently and say, brother, you're out of line here. Jim, I love you, but stop it. (laughs) And we would laugh together and I would repent and move on. Some people are gifted that way. That's basically how most of this is supposed to take place. But if your brother sins, we have to recognize that the against you, by putting that there, actually weakens the body. It actually weakens what we are supposed to be. Because if you put against you, what if he sins and it's not against you? Do we look the other way? You can't. The scripture doesn't support that. So we have this responsibility to deal with that when we see it. I've told you of our experience of confronting the deacon in the OPC church up in Dallas who decided he was going to go join the Masons and trying to deal with him in view of this, telling him that Christianity and Masonry are incompatible together. And he wouldn't hear us. He wouldn't hear me. So I did pass it up to the elders. Said, you guys, y'all need to deal with this. I don't know what ever happened. But that's what it looks like. Had I worried about the against me, because back then I didn't know it wasn't there. Had I worried about that against me portion, the elders would have never known that he'd actually joined the Masons as a deacon in the OPC church. When the body, when someone in the body sins, we should all be concerned. Christ is calling us to confront those who are in sin. Moreover, if your brother sins, go and tell his fault between you and him alone. This is a command from Christ to us. Christ intends for us to be a self-governing body that polices itself. Remember the words of the Belgic Confession. In short, it, the church, governs itself according to the pure word of God, rejecting all things contrary to it and holding Jesus Christ as the only head. Now, we do have to be wise when it comes to what Christ is saying. He doesn't want us to become busybodies going around looking for someone who sins so we can carry this out. But if we witness a brother in continual sin or come to the knowledge of our brother living in sin, we are to confront him. We have that responsibility. Now, he does give us steps or ways to think about how we are supposed to do it. Well, we are supposed to go to them privately. If your brother sins, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. Now, the biggest problem with this is this is, this is the, the implication here is that you go to them privately if their sin is private. However, if their sin is done in public, you have to address them publicly. I.e., Peter being confronted by Paul when he was separating himself from the Gentiles and eating only with the Jews. He was doing it in a public manner, in the public worship, and Paul had to call him out Publicly. We see that all the time. And and a lot of people want to say, well, you can't do this. You're you're ruining my reputation because you have made it public. No, you you sinned in public. And they think that because Matthew 18 says go privately, that that, you know, we have to do everything private. But if it's in public, the, the rest of the congregation needs to know and needs to see that this rebuke is coming from the leadership upon the one who's doing it. I think if First Timothy or Second Timothy talks about doing, dealing with Aaron elders that way. So that the whole congregation knows. But we do so privately if we're able to do it privately. 
We're also to do it in such a way where it is not vindictive. Where we are not taking justice into our own hands because vengeance belongs to the Lord. We have to work for the benefit of the one who is being called under discipline. We are seeking to have them restored. We're seeking to have them repent. So that is what we are doing there. We are to go to them privately and treat them with dignity and respect as as we can and work in that way. In heeding this call, in heeding Christ's call to what we're doing here, a good verse to help remind us of how we should function is Philippians 2, verses 3 and 4. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. When you confront a brother who's in sin, you are looking out for their best interest. You are also looking out for the best interest of those in the flock. And you are having to lower yourself and say, uh, to get yourself involved into it. And it's no fun. So with lowliness of mind, that is the best place to start with a spirit of humility. You're seeking to win the brother back. Now, th- turn it around for a minute. Let's think about this. When you go to a brother, what's his first response going to be the first time you go? They're probably going to get defensive. Wouldn't you? Most of us do. And it's okay for them to get defensive. You stick with the truth and tell them what they need to hear. And if they don't hear you immediately... Give them time. Sometimes they need to analyze what took place and think about it and have the Spirit work in their lives. But you also need to analyze what they said. Oftentimes when you have a confrontation with some, some, some person, they always say, maybe so, but I did it because. That's not the issue. The issue is you did it. And it may take you time to see that. Our goal is that God would bring about repentance in their lives. And Jesus tells us that if we have success here, we go to them in private. He says, if we if he hears you, you have gained your brother. You've gained your brother. Now listen to what he's saying. You've gained him. Already he's lost. If he continues on that path and refuses to repent, he is lost. So if he refuses, ultimately excommunication should be the logical conclusion and he should be cut off so that he knows the fullness of his sin. And that's where Jesus is going to take us. But if a brother comes to you and says you've sinned, I had a former pastor, he wasn't great of a pastor, but one of the things he was always in the habit of saying, if if somebody accuses you of a sin, more than likely there's some truth to it. So at least listen to it. Be open to it. As much as that hurts. Sin is so saturating in our world, we don't see it. And that is why Christ has given us these instructions because we don't see this own, our own sin in our own lives and we need our wives and our brothers in the Lord coming to us saying, you're out of line here. You need to repent. And a lot of times that takes place. You never even get to the point of repenting. You just say, uh, what are you thinking? Oh, right. Okay, got it. Now, another thing that needs to be brought up, and I think this is important as well. 
Given that we're given this charge by Christ, if your brother sins, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. Does that mean we tell everybody about every single one of their sins? Well, according to Peter, he says, but the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. And above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover over a multitude of sins. This is dealing with your daily sins. It's not dealing with something that is grievous or heinous in nature. Some sins are not worthy of mentioning, and our love should simply overrule our pettiness. They sinned against us. Okay, that's fine. I love them anyway. We're going to keep going. So how do we know when we need to make a case with a brother? Well, start with the Ten Commandments. Start thinking about the things that are really serious. If the person is continual in a sin, it may not be a serious sin, but if it's continual, it needs to be dealt with. Just think how Paul addressed the people in Corinth with the man who was sleeping with his father's wife. He knew immediately the man was breaking the seventh commandment and the fifth by not honoring his father. So Paul had a serious and blunt response. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together along with my spirit and with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one as to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. This man was involved in an abominable sin and needed to be dealt with quickly and forcefully. But did you hear that at the end, what he said? Paul, in being ruthless, or what some might say was ruthless, or overstepping his bounds as someone, he was not, still held out hope. Let me read it to you again. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together, and that's in worship, Along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. He's holding out hope that the man will repent. Christ calls us to confront sin with that attitude. That we will deal with it. And if there is unrepentance, then we will have to move on to the next level. Next week, we will continue with verses 16 and 17. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. And if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen to even to the church, let him be to you as Gentiles and tax collectors.